remember these champions. Not only for how they fought, but how they lived. Their stories are cemented in time. A rowdy young nation made him its first sports hero. John L. Sullivan backed up his boast with iron fists. In a life scattered with pain, in a storm of prejudice, Jack Johnson never relinquished his pride. He was a violent athlete who did not know compromise. But in life, Jack Dempsey was a man of so much charm. This quiet force for change, with his dignity and determination, Joe Lewis turned an insensitive nation suddenly colorblind. There was, it seemed, little method in his ring madness. But Rocky Marciano was from a place where substance ruled over style. He made the sport a ballet. Muhammad Ali put a human face on a brutal game. We take a look at boxing's legendary heavyweights as they have never been seen before. He stood in awe of nobody. In his own world, and he knew no other, he was sure that he was the greatest man who'd ever been or ever could. The newspapers of the 1880s dubbed him the Boston Strong Boy and his fistic holiness. But admirers didn't use those tags. Just saying John L. was enough. Boxing writer and historian, Bert Sugar. Maybe after George Washington, he was our first icon. He was the biggest thing we had between the Civil War and the Spanish-American War. In any field, he was a hero. Born 1858 in Boston, he would be boxing's last bare-knuckle champion and the first heavyweight champion under the new marquee of Queensbury rules, requiring the use of gloves. Sullivan's popularity was aided by his feud with Richard Kyle Fox, a New York newspaper publisher who was then boxing's most powerful figure. In 1881, Fox sought to dethrone Sullivan with chosen challenger Patty Ryan. But Ryan lasted barely three minutes against the champion. America adored this ring wonder, Bert Sugar. There was even the great saying back in the 1890s, shake the hand of the hand that shook the hand of John L. Sullivan. It is estimated Sullivan knocked out four to five hundred men. Yet his fearsome reputation had more to do with his personality than his boxing skills. He could walk into a saloon, which was the common currency in the 1890s, and say, I could beat any son of a bitch in the house. Reportedly, it was Sullivan who said, the bigger they come, the harder they fall. He offered $1,000 to anyone who could last four rounds with him. No one ever collected. But there was still arch enemy Richard Fox, and in 1889, he found another challenger, Jake Kilrain. Under a blistering Mississippi sun, after more than two hours of boxing, the ringside doctor told Kilrain's cornermen, your man will die if he fights anymore. When handed the $10,000 championship belt Fox made for the winner, Sullivan said, I wouldn't put that thing around the neck of a goddamn dog. This was a life lived loudly. Historian Hank Kaplan. In those days, if you could go to a tap room and guzzle down a, a quart of whiskey one day and then fight the next day, some people thought that was great. And this is the kind of an image that he developed, that he, was, he could drink like hell and fight like hell. As vicious as Sullivan could be, he nonetheless detested bare-knuckle fighting. By preferring gloves, he inadvertently helped boxing. Writer-historian Jack Fisk. Sullivan could be given credit for making boxing reputable, not by self-design, but because he insisted on using gloves in the ring, which limited wrestling and dirty fighting and crooked fights. Boxing soon became legal in a lot of states where it was previously outlawed. In 1892, age 34, unfit and withered by drink, Sullivan met gentleman Jim Corbett and was knocked out. The only knockout and only defeat of his career. The words of writer W.W. Naughton. Now the crowd was strangely silent. 
Though their appreciation of Corbett's accomplishment was unmistakable, it was a catastrophe, a national calamity. The defeat of the Boston Strong Boy, a man born to be champion. In 1902, Sullivan filed for bankruptcy, listing debts totaling $2,658. His only asset, the clothes on his back. 16 years later, John L. was dead. Hank Kaplan. It was an emotional funeral service, because this guy was bigger than life. It was tough for a lot of people to believe that they were losing John L. Sullivan. On the bitterly cold day Sullivan was buried, dynamite was used to break the frozen earth. Former opponent Jake Kilrain was heard to whisper, just as John would have liked it. He used his hands to cut, bruise, and torment those he hated, and his tongue was almost as wounding. Some are meant to walk the earth like giants, believing the world is subject to their whims. And so it was for Jack Johnson, who married two white women and had the gall to expect white America to accept him on his terms. He was a black man who had it all. He was the trickle that would become a waterfall, a brazen pathfinder, his audacity displayed with a wide smile. Writer-historian Bert Sugar. When he was sitting in his corner, he would purposefully miss spitting into the spittoon and he'd spit on the table with pinpoint accuracy of all the writers sitting there hitting their papers. He loved crossing the color line. He loved doing outrageous things. Jack Johnson loved to be Jack Johnson. It was the wrong time, but he didn't care. This was turn-of-the-century America, when segregation had just been sanctioned by the Supreme Court, 50 years before the roar of Martin Luther King. Yet somehow, here he was at center stage, intriguing and frightening. Historian Hank Kaplan. America has a long history in, in being bigoted against and prejudiced against the black men. And um, here comes a great black athlete from Galveston, Texas, and Whitey just couldn't handle that. Just couldn't handle it. For years denied a title shot, Johnson humiliated champion Tommy Burns in 1908. Burt Sugar. Now we're back to that underlying question. It's all right to have a black champion as a middleweight, a welderweight, a lightweight, heavyweight champion. All of a sudden, Jack Johnson meant that the white man's burden had become the white man's master. The party began for the new champion, who traveled the world indulging himself, ensuring he would be more hated than loved. In 1910, former champion Jim Jeffries was lured out of retirement and installed as the Great White Hope. Inactive for six years, incredibly, Jeffries was favored by many. Writer, friend, Don Buchan. There's a story that uh, two blacks went into a cafe and one of them said, give me a cup of coffee with cream, weak and white, like Jeffries. The other said, give me a cup of coffee, black and strong, like Jack Johnson. The result would unleash racial hatred. There were riots, killings. Suddenly, it was against federal law to ship fight films across state lines. The reverberations were long-lasting. Burt Sugar. Basically, Jack Johnson's fall from grace meant that for the next 20 years, blacks were, with rare exceptions, blackballed, no pun intended, prohibited, kept out of sports and boxing specifically. In 1913, Johnson fled the U.S. to escape jail. He was charged unfairly with interstate prostitution because of his travels with a white woman. Later, he lost his title in exile to Jess Willard. Suspicions remain about a fix. Don Buchan. Johnson was seven years in France with his appetite for sweets and French wines, and he was 37 years of age. He would have gotten the decision had it been 10 rounds or 12 or 15, but he just didn't have the gas to go any farther. 26 rounds, and the rock-hard 
Kansan giant Jess Willard got the title. In 1920, Johnson surrendered to federal lawmen, expecting leniency. Instead, he got a year at Leavenworth Penitentiary. Wealthy no more, he was still doing exhibitions at age 50. I should not be here, but I am here. I want to do something good. And out of doing that something good, something will come good to me. It was June 10, 1946. Not long after being refused service at a roadside cafe in North Carolina, Johnson lost control of his Lincoln Zephyr. The car was traveling at a high speed when it slammed into a power pole. He was 68 years old. As it happened, there was no second chapter in his life. Just silence after the cheering had stopped. He managed to achieve greatness as a boxer, but it could be said he achieved something more as an American pioneer. Jack Dempsey. Dempsey. It has the ring of history, of Americana, of a gaudy era that will probably never come this way again. The lyrical nickname, the Manassas Mauler, referred to his Colorado birthplace, but the family left before he could walk. The Dempseys were wanderers. Writer, Jack Fisk. He was part Indian, Irish, Scotch. He had, he had the, the ethnic makeup that, that, that reached a lot of people. He was a coal miner. He was a hobo. He rode the freight trains. He fought in saloons. He uh, came up the hardwood. Before the world knew him, he was a mama's boy who could be mean when angry. He was a young hustler who earned nickels and dimes fighting in mining town saloons. That all changed when Doc Kearns became his manager. Together, they reinvented boxing. They turned it into big business. Writer-historian, Burt Sugar. Paul Gallico called the 20s the golden age of sports. And the first member of the pantheon of the golden age of sports happened July 4th, 1919, in Toledo, Ohio, when Jack Dempsey knocked down Jess Willard, the heavyweight champion, seven times in the first round and almost out. He had made this climb to become our second hero after John L. Sullivan. Hollywood called with a $50,000 offer for a film titled Daredevil Jack. He earned more cash cavorting on the vaudeville circuit. The boxer became a barnstormer. Doc Kearns' son, Jack Kearns. I remember my father telling me one time that this young guy came in and challenged Dempsey to a fight, and he gave Dempsey a bad time, and then he got hit on the chin and he went down. He talked to my father and said, look, Doc, I can do that every night. He says, I can fight like hell, but only for about a round. And I'll meet you in Oshkosh or Kenosha or anywhere you want to go, and I'll stay two towns out in front of you. I'll go bang a few guys around the town and get a reputation, and then I'll show up for the night of the fight, and I'll make a good fight of it with Jack. And that's what they did, and they took the show on the road, and that's vaudeville. The Manassas Mauler became the common man's idol, Bert Sugar. Dempsey used to come in without a robe, without socks, with a Super Bowl haircut. Dempsey was unique. He snarled. He had that patent leather black hair, five o'clock shadow, and he fought like the avenging angel of death. Historian Hank Kaplan. People looked up to him because of that style. It was rugged. It was power. It was toughness. His ability to fire away and stand in under fire against bigger men. And uh, the finality with which he completed his, his contests. His career barely survived the discovery of this publicity photo. It showed Dempsey in street shoes pretending to help the war effort. Though he had been given a deferment, Dempsey was now seen as a draft dodger, Jack Kearns. It almost was devastating to him, just personally. And it took him a long time to overcome that. There's really nothing anybody could have done about something like that. But I think that's one of the reasons that Dempsey's personality was such that he wanted to be the good guy, because there he was the consummate bad guy. And he made every effort not to make another mistake from that point on. 
So did my father. Dempsey's deception soured the American public. Enormous crowds paid to see him lose. In boxing's first million dollar gate, Dempsey crushed George Carpentier. It wasn't until 1926 that Dempsey haters got what they wanted as he lost the title to Tunney. A year later, Tunney beat Dempsey again. But in the seventh round, Tunney, not flat, was saved by the famous long count. Tunney got up to win by decision. Hank Kaplan. He became more popular after the, the second loss than he ever was before. And now after these two valiant efforts against Gene Tunney, he, he won his place back in their hearts again. You know, son, that fight will go down as the battle of the long, long count. He didn't win, but he's still a great favorite and the idol of millions. Is he fighting anymore? No, Jack gave up the ring after that fight. How I'd love to meet him. Fight manager, Marv Jansen. He was my idol. In fact, I told the kids that he was my dad. And they wouldn't believe me. I had to beat up on several of them to make sure that they believed that I could have been Jack Dempsey's kid. The unpopular champion became a popular ex-champion. His restaurant on Broadway became a New York City landmark where he dispensed autographs and kind words. And he used his celebrity to help those who couldn't help themselves. Dempsey died a folk hero in 1983. Jack Kearns. I think the thing that made Jack Dempsey the larger-than-life character is the same thing that made Babe Ruth, the same thing that made a Ty Cobb. I think it's the same thing that made a Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I think it's just that they were meant to be. They're that charismatic person. In Dempsey's case, I think he grew into it. He discovered it was there for him, and he accepted it, and he developed it. And he had a combination of being with the most colorful boxing manager in the history of boxing. Bert Sugar. In a day and age when Jack Dempsey was one of the have-nots, he turned into one of the most caring haves in the history of the world, let alone sports. He is a credit to his race, the human race. My name is Jim Little, 20 years old, 6 feet 1, 495 pounds, but we're in 10 from the other thing. The grandson of slaves, so poor once he had no shoes for school. Joe Lewis, an unlikely American story, would reshape his world. Historian Angelo Prospero. After Jack Johnson horrified many millions with his uh, behavior too extreme for the times, it took a special kind of black individual to soothe the wounds and bring about respectability to enter a white man's domain, uh, which was boxing. In 1937, Lewis became the first black to fight for the heavyweight title in 22 years. The knockout of James Braddock started a record 12-year reign. Former trainer Ray Arcel. I worked against him 14 times. Every time he'd say me, he'd say, you'll be again. Joe Lewis was in there for one purpose, to knock your brains out. And he did. And you learned from him. You saw things there that you wouldn't believe a guy would do. But he did it. And he had the uncanny ability to be able to knock you out with a chair. He could punch. He had power. I hated to see him lose, even though he was fighting my fighter. The heavyweight championship belongs to this guy. He made it. Lewis won 63 of 66 fights. He won with dignity and humility. Wrote Jimmy Cannon, he ducked no one and bragged less than any champion I've ever known. Trainer Eddie Futch. He wasn't boastful. He was good and he respected people. He was inspirational because he, he conducted himself so well in public. People were proud of him because he was a good role model. Joe Lewis is one of the friendliest fellows you'd ever want to meet, outside the ring, of course. Before the confrontations in Montgomery and Selma, before the march on Washington, before Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, there was the quiet strength of Joe Lewis. Bert Sugar. Had it not been for Joe Lewis, 
we probably wouldn't have had a Jackie Robinson in more ways than one. When Jackie Robinson ran into trouble in Fort Riley, Kansas, for not moving to the back of the bus because some bigot had told him to, who counseled him? Joe Lewis. He probably was the first black athlete to transcend being a hero only to one group of people. In 1936, in a shocking upset, the undefeated Lewis was knocked out by Germany's Max Schmeling. Two years later, the rematch was a taste of the ugliness that was ahead. Lewis remembered the time. People were telling me how Hitler was saying that a good German could be any color man. With Hitler's rise and his dream of a master race, with war about to explode in Europe, the 1938 Lewis Schmeling rematch became a contest of political ideologies. American democracy versus Aryan superiority. Lewis even got a pep talk from President Franklin D. Roosevelt. He felt my muscles and said that, well, this is kind of muscles we're going to need to be Germany with. In this fight, Lewis was not a black American, just simply an American. I hope this doesn't fail me. Lynch and rope round is back against the woods again. They're not too close to the rope. Lewis out, and Lewis missed with a left wing, but in close. Right to the jaw, and again, a right to the body. Lewis wins the fight. Lewis wins the fight. Lewis wins the fight. Schmeling, one sports writer wrote, was caught and mangled in the whirring claws of a mad and feverish machine. The bout lasted one round. German radio cut transmission before it was over. Bert Sugar. Lewis carried the hopes of everyone against Hitler's master race. Black, white, Christian, Jew. It was a magic moment in the history of sports and the sociological history of our culture. In this corner, Joe Lewis. Your orders to report an induction of the United States Army as a private. Anxious to do his part, Lewis volunteered in 1942 and became the only man to serve in the military while heavyweight champion. Lewis was in his athletic prime when he gave four years to the military. He entertained more than five million troops. He fought in 96 exhibitions, but he didn't accept every invitation. Eddie Futch. The heavyweight champion of the British Army was among the British soldiers. Uh, he wanted to spar with Joe Lewis. Joe begged out. He didn't want to spar with him. He says, but if you want to see your champion spar, we have a middleweight here. See, he'll, he'll spar with your champion. And he put Jimmy Edgar on him. Jimmy Edgar knocked him out. Joe said that he wanted to avoid having to knock out the British soldier. They were allies. That was a diplomatic move that you wouldn't expect an ordinary fighter to make. In 1948, the 34-year-old Lewis, his skills faltering, retired after winning a brutal battle against Jersey Joe Walcott. Well, I'd like to say again that I retired tonight with my last fight. Thank you very much. At this point, Lewis had earned $5 million, but it was squandered away by his high living, gambling, and bad investments. Worse, the Internal Revenue Service claimed he owed a million dollars in back taxes and penalties. You know, it's getting awfully close to April 15th. Uh, well, you've had some income tax problems. How are you getting along? Well, uh, my, on my present tax, I'm getting along, I'm getting along good. So the back tax, but I'm, well, I'm not doing so good. I'm still behind. <laughs> About how much behind, Joe? Oh, oh, that's, I don't know. I take the faggot. By the, uh, by the end of next year, it'll probably be uh, a little bit more. Based on hurt from the government, it was uh, over a million dollars. And it keeps building year <laughs> by year. Yeah, that's right. Lewis could not pay the IRS, but he was never compromised by his financial circumstances. Matchmaker, Teddy Brenner. And Joe, when he had no money, he was offered $50,000 to do a soft drink ad just to use his picture on a billboard in South Africa. And even though he didn't have any money, he turned it down. In 1950, the money problems forced Lewis out of retirement. He was 36, doing the job he knew best. A year later, a new boxing star ended this legend's career.
It was among the saddest nights in sports. Historian Angelo Prospero. I went outside of the garden. Uh, you know, I was a little depressed because it was really the end of a career. I really idolized them. And lo and behold, coming out of the garden with a couple of his buddies was Joe Lewis. And I went up to him and I said, Joe, I'm, I'm a great fan of yours. I'm sorry that you got beaten, he says. Don't worry, I knocked out a lot of guys myself. And he turned and walked down with his friends and looking back just once to see his name in lights on the garden marquee, which probably would be for the last time. His debts kept him on a treadmill. He took quick cash in pro wrestling. Later, the man some consider the world's greatest heavyweight was greeting gamblers at Caesar's Palace. In 1981, at age 66, Joe Lewis, the Brown Bomber, was gone, and the world said goodbye. Angelo Prospero. Joe Lewis today is buried in Arlington Cemetery with uh, the great heroes of our country. And it's, it's very deserving because of what he did, you know, for our country. Joe Lewis wasn't a black champion. He wasn't a white champion. Joe Lewis was America's champion. America took him to their heart, and they exalted his victories. Uh, they took this black Moses to, uh, to their bosoms, uh, you know, as one of their own. They worried with him over his uh, tax problem. They agonized, uh, you know, over his uh, uh, illnesses, you know, and, and even when he died, it brought about profound sorrow, you know, throughout the world. I think America had a love affair with Joe Lewis because Joe Lewis loved America. He would bleed without protest and ache without complaint if he could be called champion. Obscurity was all he feared. I'll tell you a story about the kind of guy Rocky was. Publicist Murray Goodman. I brought him up to Rochester where we gave away the Hickok belt. And Ray Hickok fell in love with him. And he gave him a hundred gross of the little miniature boxing gloves. The next week at camp, Rocky was selling them for a dollar a pair. He was, I wouldn't say cheap, but that was his upbringing. He could not be described as graceful. Even his trainer, Charlie Goldman, refused to conceal the obvious. Said Goldman, he was one of the clumsiest fellows I ever saw in the ring. Rocky Marciano did not appear to have the height or size of a legend in the making. He was five foot ten, around 185 pounds. But Marciano had a frightening tolerance for pain, and a fury few have possessed. My mother said that I was destined to be a fighter because I looked so much like one as a young kid. Brother, if looks mean anything, look out for the Brockton Blockbuster. Born Rocco Francis Marchegiano. Years later, Marciano would become his ring name. He first dreamed of playing baseball. Then came World War II and the Army, the beginning of his experiments in the sweet science. So he came late to boxing, 24 years old when he had his first pro fight. He relied on a primal desire that reminded many of Jack Dempsey, Rocky's youngest brother, Peter. I think especially Italian people, and a lot of times, underworld people liked being around Rocky because he was everything that they wanted to be. Family friend, Pat Petronelli. Everybody wanted to be a fighter. All the kids were shadow boxing in town. They all, <laughs> they all, they all opened up little gyms. And uh, the Italians especially in Brockton, they loved, they loved Rocky. Raised in Brockton, Massachusetts, the son of Italian immigrants, a child of the Depression who carried lunch daily to a father he'd see slumped over a shoemaking machine. Marciano wanted so much more for himself and his family. Hello, boxing fans, wherever you may be, but especially to those in New England, 
I'm in good shape for this fight, and I hope I come through all right. In 1951, the future Marciano collided with the past Joe Lewis, age 37. Years before, there had been a kinder, gentler encounter. Izzy Gold. He was a guest referee at the Brockton Arena one night, and we followed him to the men's room. He went in a stall, and I boosted Rocky up, and then he boosted me up. And Joe Lewis looked up and saw us, and when he came out, he gave us a buck apiece. So that was one of the biggest things in our lives. Little would be known that that kid that he gave the dollar to would knock him out later on in life. It was amazing when you think about it. In 1952, opposing heavyweight champion Jersey Joe Walcott was a test of pain. Is he gold? Every punch, he lifted Rocky off the canvas. I don't think any living human could take the punishment that Rocky took that night and still win the fight. It was unbelievable. Historian Angelo Prospero. So that one right hand that night in Philadelphia created the mystique of uh, Rocky Marciano and made him as a great champion. The shoe town had a new identity, and Brockton proudly celebrated its native son. Thousands of the city's working class citizens had gambled it all on Marciano. Homes, cars, and bank accounts. This was their thank you. Pat Petronelli remembers the day. Here's a fellow that I've gone to movies with, and all of a sudden, he's a giant. It didn't look real, and it didn't feel real. Here's my guy that I've known for years, my buddy, and you know, I'm screaming like everybody else. I said, what are they hollering at? All of a sudden, Rocky's little car come by us, and I jumped in and hollered as loud as everybody else. Hi, champ. Good luck, champ. Peter Marciano was in a parade car behind his brother. I honestly believe he would have been much more comfortable maybe walking down the street or maybe being one of the crowd waving to that famous person driving down the street in the open vehicle. Even as champion, it was said he had the grin of a shy fellow happy to be recognized. In April 1956, his record 49 and 0 with 43 knockouts, Marciano summoned Murray Goodman to his New York hotel room. So what the hell's going on here? He says, uh, I can't bend down and get up. My back is killing me. I said, what's your problem? He says, I think I ought to retire. I said, after telling me this, you're asking me a question? He says, of course you ought to retire. He said, okay, call a press conference. The next day, we call a press conference. He announced his retirement. I would like to announce my retirement from boxing at this time. A lot of different versions of this, but mine is the true one. And so it was that Marciano, age 31, after just six title defenses, retired undefeated before his powers had diminished. Years later, on the night before his 46th birthday, August 31, 1969, he boarded a private plane flying from Chicago to Des Moines, Iowa. Peter Marciano. I was contacted by uh, a person in Florida at about 1.30 in the morning. I called my mom. My dad answered the phone. My mom got on the other line. And I said, Mom, something terrible has happened. Rocky was killed in a plane crash. At that point in time, my mom said, Filimi Kordamam, translated means my son, the heart of my life. A moment I will never forget. The father was devastated. He felt that something of great importance left his life. And uh, it was not too long after that that uh, dad ended up passing away. Nikki Sylvester. It's something that people don't know when Marciano got killed. He was decapitated. Closed casket. The people never knew why. I had found out why. And I was told that Joe Lewis kissed the top of the casket and looked at the ceiling of the funeral pile down in Florida and said, uh, uh, God is giving himself a beautiful man. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Amazing. Really amazing. Should never have been. Izzy Gold. I think of him all the time. It got so now I can't even watch his fight films. It was a terrible shock in my life. Marciano appeared to attract pain because he so often walked into punches. But he compensated for a lack of artistry with round after round of relentless attack. Perhaps Rocky Marciano endured when others did not because what he feared far more than the pounding was the possibility of losing. The fear of being something less than the heavyweight champion of the world. He never changed. From the time we were kids, he never changed. He was Rocky. History may never determine if he was a better fighter than Dempsey or Lewis or a few others, but no boxer ever dominated the sports scene like Muhammad did. I'm a pitch of confidence. I'm the greatest thing. I'm the resurrect of the fight game. You are. If it wasn't for me, the whole thing would be dead. Quickly, he turned boxing upside down. Quickly, he became a spokesman for a rapidly changing society. But few messengers had this kind of appeal. We look at Miss World, we see white. We look at Miss Universe, we see white. Even Todd, the king of the jungle in back Africa, he's white. The boxing ring was always too small to contain the force of this personality. He became so much more than a gifted athlete. His following cut across every human category. He was loved by the old, and he was loved by the young. Ali's former business manager, Gene Kilroy. Muhammad Ali is an individual who always had time for the poor, the powerless, the depressed, the deprived. I remember one time at, at the training camp, a little boy came by, and Muhammad asked him, why are you wearing this gold cap? It's so warm out. And the kid took the hat off, and he was bald. He said, I'm sick, and I'm going under chemotherapy. And Ali said, what's wrong? He said he had some type of cancer. And Ali said, well, you're going to be okay, and God will look out for you, and I'll pray for you. Well, about two months later, I got a call, and uh, the boy's father said, my son's in University of Pennsylvania Hospital, and it's just a matter of time. So Ali, the next morning, uh, he and I drove down the Pennsylvania Turnpike, and when we walked in, the little boy was laying in the bed, and the little boy said, uh, Muhammad, I knew you would come to see me. Said, Ali, I'm going to be with God, and I'm going to be able to tell him that I know you. He will be remembered for his boldness, for his elementary poetry, modern literature that was meant to make you laugh. Like Butterfly sting like a bee. Ah! Run the young man, run. Get and run away and be able to fight another day. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to lose your money, then bet on Sunday. Muhammad was a lousy poet. Ali trainer. Angelo Dundee. But the thing is, it was different. It was unique coming from a fighter. In fact, the Poet Society wanted to meet him. No one ever got such enjoyment out of predicting future triumphs. This will be the greatest prediction in the history of all boxing. Not four, not six, but five. I've never been wrong. I predict around eight to prove I'm great. Sonny Liston will be all man in round nine and we forgave his ridiculous audacity. I am the king of the world! Never talk about who's gonna stop me. Only nobody gonna stop me. And I just turned 22 years old. I must be the greatest. I'll fight that chump in a telephone booth. I'm a bad man. I shook up the world. I shook up the world. Even during his nearly four-year exile from the ring, the result of his refusal to be drafted, Ali remained a human magnet. Ali's physician, Bertie Pacheco. He was trying to talk to two English promoters about um, fighting maybe in England. And they said, well, you've been gone for three years. You think anybody remembers you? And, he, and they were in New York on Broadway. And Ali said, I'll tell you what, how much money have you got in your pocket? And he said, you know, a thousand, whatever it was. So I bet you that money that I'll get out here at this street corner. And I'll walk to the next street corner. I won't say a word. And if I don't stop traffic by the time I get to the next street corner, I'll pay you a thousand. By the time he was at mid's block, he was mobbed. By the time he got to the corner, the cops had to come start breaking up people so the taxis and things had to go, go through. He was enormous. Ali will be remembered, too, for his public displays of courage, for his undaunting faithfulness to his religion and to his race. 
Even if it means facing machine gun fire that day, I will face it before denouncing Elijah Muhammad and the religion of Islam. I'm ready to die. We are, are striving today for freedom, justice, and equality. And as a matter of fact, the whole world is fighting for freedom, justice, and equality. Boxing writer, Bert Sugar. Here's a man who believes, and he was willing to give up everything for his belief. How many people can you say that about? I've turned down $8 million in movies, commercials, advertisements, endorsements before draft haven't came up because of my religious beliefs. Mr. Clay, when you... Muhammad Ali, sir. Mr. Clay... Muhammad Ali, uh, sir. Mr. Muhammad Ali, either yes, one. Just Muhammad Ali, When sir. you appeared before this commission before, if I recall correctly, you said you were the people's champion? Yes, sir. Do you think that you're acting like a people's champion? Yes, sir. Daughter, May May Ali. I admire his consistency in his, his religion, his religious faith. I admire that more than anything, more than his boxing. He never forgot his purpose. He was saying back in the early days, God gave me this talent to box so I could be an influence on other people. The number one greeting in my faith is peace, and that is Assalamu alaikum. Ali was never disheartened by his punishing profession. He wasn't interested in its tragedies. He lived for comedy. Ferdy Pacheco. When it came to humor, he was the funniest of any heavyweight champion in the world. I mean, funny all the time. Come on, girl. We in Manila. He knew how to take a situation and extract the humor from it and put everybody at ease because of that. And I want to show the world that it really ain't nothing to you. Don't touch me. I'll beat your brains out. I won't eat none of you. Look at that pretty heart. Another white heart. Please. Now stand up. Look over there. Stand up. You gotta stand up. Over there, field. See the big one down here? Yeah. Let's go. Television carried his image around the globe. And it is possible that no one, no head of state, no religious figure, has ever been as famous as this man, Gene Kilroy. When we were in Zaire, Africa, they didn't know about President Kennedy. They didn't know about Winston Churchill, but they knew Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali, they would yell. Assigned by no nation, universally accepted, he became, in time, a goodwill ambassador. I'm so honored and not happy to see that I have so many fans here in Japan. Writer, historian, Bert Sugar. He's one of the few who's touched everybody. Good, bad, and different, he's touched everybody. Muhammad Ali, you've got to know about, no matter if you're a sports fan or not, in every country of the world. Who's the heavyweight champion of the world? I don't think there's ever been a man who has had, in the last hundred years, such a presence as Muhammad Ali for the world, not for a country. Can my title be taken without me being whooped? No! no! One more time! No! no! That's all, all I can do. I always get the feeling that Muhammad Ali is afraid there's somebody's hand in this world he hasn't shaken yet, and he's still out on that course. This is the most gregarious person in the history of the universe. I am the greatest. So many have witnessed his glories. So many have shared his defeats. And now we choose to relish what once was. Gene Kilroy. He tells me about his Parkinson syndrome. And he said, Gene, it could have been worse. A lot of great people didn't even live to be 50. I'm 50 years old. I've done everything. I have no regrets about boxing. I have no regrets. We have traveled with Muhammad Ali on a journey that has been more delightful than sad. And the memories of this journey are too sharp to ever fade. Wrote Lee Montville, who made boxing his movable feast. Bert Sugar. What hurts today worse than I think anything is that those people, myself included, who've grown up with Ali, see him as an older man, which means we're older. So we blame his being old and our being old on him. 
And I think we should be more charitable to the man who gave us so much in his youth and kept us young so long. This is the legend of Cassius Clay, the most beautiful fighter in the world today. He talks a great deal and brags indeedy of a muscular punch that's incredibly speedy. The physic world was dull and weary. With a champ like Liston, things had to be dreary. Then someone with color, someone with dash, brought fight fans a-running with cash. This brash young boxer is something to see, and the heavyweight championship is his destiny. This kid fights great. He's got speed and endurance. But if you sign to fight him, increase your insurance. <laughs> this kid's got a left. This kid's got a right. And if he hits you once, you're asleep for the night. And as you lie on the floor while the ref counts ten, you pray that you won't have to fight me again. For I'm the man this poem is about, the next champ of the world, there isn't a doubt. Here I predict, and I know the score, I'll be champ of the world in 64. If Kasha says a mosquito could pull a plow, don't ask how, hitch him up. <laughs> of nobody. In his own world, and he knew no other, he was sure that he was the greatest man who'd ever been or ever could. The newspapers of the 1880s dubbed him the Boston Strong Boy and his fistic holiness, but admirers didn't use those tags. Just saying John L. was enough. Boxing writer and historian Bert Sugar. Maybe after George Washington, he was our first icon. He was the biggest thing we had between the Civil War and the Spanish-American War. In any field, he was a hero. Born 1858 in Boston, he would be boxing's last bare-knuckle champion and the first heavyweight champion under the new marquee of Queensbury rules, requiring the use of gloves. Sullivan's popularity was aided by his feud with Richard Kyle Fox, a New York newspaper publisher who was then boxing's most powerful figure. In 1881, Fox sought to dethrone Sullivan with chosen challenger Patty Ryan. But Ryan lasted barely three minutes against the champion. America adored this ring wonder, Bert Sugar. There was even the great saying back in the 1890s, shake the hand of the hand that shook the hand of John L. Sullivan. It is estimated Sullivan knocked out four to 500 men. Yet his fearsome reputation had more to do with his personality than his boxing skills. He could walk into a saloon, which was the common currency in the 1890s, and say, I could. champions, not only for how they fought, but how they lived. Their stories are cemented in time. A rowdy young nation made him its first sports hero. John L. Sullivan backed up his boast with iron fists. In a life scattered with pain, in a storm of prejudice, Jack Johnson never relinquished his pride. He was a violent athlete who did not know compromise. But in life, Jack Dempsey was a man of so much charm. This quiet force for change, with his dignity and determination, Joe Lewis turned an insensitive nation suddenly colorblind. There was, it seemed, little method in his ring madness. But Rocky Marciano was from a place where substance ruled over style. He made the sport of ballet. Muhammad Ali put a human face on a brutal game. We take a look at boxing's legendary heavyweights as they have never been seen before. John L. Sullivan. He stood in on Jim Corbett and was knocked out. The only knockout and only defeat of his career. The words of writer W.W. Naughton. Now the crowd was strangely silent. 
Though their appreciation of Corbett's accomplishment was unmistakable, it was a catastrophe, a national calamity. The defeat of the Boston Strong Boy, a man born to be champion. In 1902, Sullivan filed for bankruptcy, listing debts totaling $2,658. His only asset, the clothes on his back. 16 years later, John L. was dead. Hank Kaplan. It was an emotional funeral service, because this guy was bigger than life. It was tough for a lot of people to believe that they were losing John L. Sullivan. On the bitterly cold day Sullivan was buried, dynamite was used to break the frozen earth. Former opponent Jake Kilrain was heard to whisper, just as John would have liked it. his hands to cut, bruise, and torment those he hated, and his tongue was almost as wounding. Some are meant to walk the earth like giants, believing the world is subject to their whims. And so it was for Jack Johnson, who married two white women and had the gall to expect white America to accept him on his terms. He was a black man who had it all. He was the trickle that would become a waterfall, a brazen pathfinder, his audacity displayed with a wide smile. Writer-historian Bert Sugar. When he was sitting in his corner, he would purposefully miss spitting into the spittoon and he'd spit on the table with pinpoint accuracy of all the writers sitting there hitting their papers. He loved crossing the color line. He loved doing outrageous things. Jack Johnson loved to be Jack Johnson. It was the wrong time, but he didn't care. This was turn-of-the-century America, when segregation had just been sanctioned by the Supreme Court, 50 years before the roar of Martin Luther King. Yet somehow, here he was at center stage, intriguing and frightening. Historian Hank Kaplan. America has a long history in, in being bigoted against and prejudiced against the black men. And um, here comes a great black athlete from Galveston, Texas, and Whitey just couldn't handle that. Just couldn't handle it. For years denied a title shot, Johnson humiliated champion Tommy Burns in 1908. Burt Sugar. Now we're back to that underlying question. It's all right to have a black champion as a middleweight, a welderweight, a lightweight, a heavyweight champion. All of a sudden, Jack Johnson meant that they would eat any son of a bitch in the house. Reportedly, it was Sullivan who said, the bigger they come, the harder they fall. He offered $1,000 to anyone who could last four rounds with him. No one ever collected. But there was still arch enemy Richard Fox, and in 1889, he found another challenger, Jake Kilrain. Under a blistering Mississippi sun, after more than two hours of boxing, the ringside doctor told Kilrain's cornermen, your man will die if he fights anymore. When handed the $10,000 championship belt Fox made for the winner, Sullivan said, I wouldn't put that thing around the neck of a goddamn dog. This was a life lived loudly. Historian Hank Kaplan. In those days, if you can go to a tap room and guzzle down a, a quart of whiskey one day and then fight the next day, some people thought that was great. And this is the kind of an image that he developed, that he, was, he could drink like hell and fight like hell. As vicious as Sullivan could be, he nonetheless detested bare-knuckle fighting. By preferring gloves, he inadvertently helped boxing. Writer-historian Jack Fisk. Sullivan could be given credit for making boxing reputable, not by self-design, but because he insisted on using gloves in the ring, which limited wrestling and dirty fighting and crooked fights. Boxing soon became legal in a lot of states where it was previously outlawed. In 1892, age 34, unfit and withered by drink, Sullivan met General 